I was a child of the early 60s, the so-called silent generation. <laughs> now, at that time, the best job for a young woman just graduating from college was wife. Failing that, she could be a secretary, or a teacher, or a nurse. I chose teaching. Today, no self-respecting young female teacher would be caught dead, trussed up like we were. Long line bra, girdle, nylons. The women of the 19th century had nothing on us. We, we slept every night on gigantic aluminum rollers. But hey! We felt free and independent. My roommate and I, as new teachers, earned the princely salary of $4,895 a month. And we thought we were rich. And we were totally wrapped up in our new jobs, teaching 8th, 9th, and 10th graders. But after two years, wonderful years, of learning how to be an independent adult, the beautiful Napa Valley where I lived suddenly seemed to shrink. It actually seemed to get smaller, and I was beginning to feel squeezed. I loved my work, my job as a teacher, but something was missing. What was it? It was not a man. <laughs> and then I discovered I wanted to travel. So I started looking around, and I found some jobs with Army Special Services in Europe. But when I went to the interview in San Francisco, the jobs in, in, in uh, Europe had evaporated. The recruiter began to describe jobs where there were, places where there were jobs. South Korea. Korea? She began describing a tough, challenging job in a country that was still recovering from war. No false promises, no embellishments. I was fascinated. So Army Special Services no longer exists. But in 1965, they staff ran libraries, craft centers, and service clubs in military bases all over the world. Though we were civilians, we wore clunky blue uniforms. We arrived in Seoul on a cold October night. As we crossed the bridge over the Han River, Lining the road on both sides were tiny little huts, each lit by one single candle lantern. The people in them were dressed in layers of shabby fabric selling five nails, two feet of plastic sheeting, 12 pieces of charcoal. I saw tiny children in crudely knit suits with, with no shoes in the cold. As the bus inched along, I stared trying to take in this strange scene. This was my introduction to the world beyond America. My first station was in Pusan, in the south of Korea, where I became the program director for a service club. Months later, I was transferred farther north and promoted to club director. Now I had a club to run, American and Korean employees to supervise. And because we lived very close to the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, a no-nonsense military environment to work in. But that year in Korea was an absolutely wonderful introduction to international work. Why? Because I had the familiar support and assistance of the base, but I could make forays out into the culture anytime I wanted to, and I did, mesmerized and excited by each new adventure. But then? A year later, I went home, back to teaching in California. But I was changed. And special services kept pestering me. Letters, phone calls, they needed people in Vietnam. My family was distraught. My friends thought I was nuts. Nobody said anything, but I could see it in their eyes. There's a war going on over there. I knew that. But I also knew that I now had the skills and experience to do something. And that made the siren song very strong. Six months later, I landed in Saigon. <laughs> that song was playing in the cafeteria 
on my first morning in Vietnam. I spent the night in the before in a bare room, two cots, gray sheets, dirty taped windows, and signs posted everywhere that said, in the event of an attack, get under the bed. <laughs> what in the hell had I gotten myself into? But it got better. I was posted to the Mekong Delta in the south, to a large army aviation base near the town of Canto. We lived in an old villa downtown, and we commuted every day to the base. Nancy, a seasoned, wiry veteran of combat duty farther north, was my teacher. But tensions were rising. We were moved back on base, issued flak jackets and helmets, and a bunker was built just a few feet from our new trailer. And then, out of the blue, I was transferred further south to a smaller base near the town of Vin Long. Now, there weren't any female quarters in the base at that time. So I lived at the nearby Convent of the Good Shepherd. <laughs> what a place of peace that was. It was a school for girls. And I rapidly became a big sister. Konam, they called me. And they taught me all their games and songs. And once again, I found myself immersed in a culture. Now, there was no service club at the base at that time. So we had to build one out of the Mekong mud. I very quickly learned how to borrow, steal whatever I could, materials and assistance from wherever I could get it. We opened on Christmas Eve in a room that had uh, a floor and wall studs and a roof, but no actual walls. So we used Christmas paper. Our patrons arrived late, staggering along behind a staff sergeant, a Pied Piper, who was blowing the sweetest, coolest jazz trumpet you have ever heard. Ho, ho, what a party that was. <laughs> and then, out of the blue, I was transferred again back to Canto. And a few days later, it was February, 1968. All hell broke loose. It was the Tet Offensive. And while my assistant Judy and I huddled in the bunker, cursing our uselessness, the base at Vin Long was attacked. And the airfield commander, Lieutenant Colonel Tommy Thompson, was killed. Years later, I went to Washington, D.C., to the wall, searching for Tommy. He had been my friend and my advocate. When I found his name, I, I reached out and ran my fingers over it gently and wondered if his family had ever been there. Well, after a year there, I went home and I got married. And my new husband and I promptly joined the Peace Corps and were assigned to the Philippines where I got my first job as a teacher trainer. Oh, but my teachers taught me so much more about the Philippines, about their lives as women, as teachers. And then I had a son, Philip, for the Philippines. <laughs> he was really named for his grandfather, but we never said anything. And then after the Peace Corps, my husband went to medical school there. And we had a little girl, Pia. Ten years after we left the Philippines, we got a chance to go back to the Peace Corps in Cameroon, in Central West Africa, where my husband would be the Peace Corps doc. Now, the kids were pretty much grown by that time, so we left as Philip here in Washington to finish his senior year, and we took 14-year-old Pia with us. Bad decision. <laughs> My 14-year-old did not want a cross-cultural experience. No. <laughs> she wanted football games and telephones and malls. Poor child. <laughs> she was so miserable. But she soldiered on. And I have never been prouder of her. 
In Cameroon, I did short-term work with CARE Cameroon and the United Nations Development Project. Then in December 1990, I got my first crack at a Peace Corps training director program. You see, our neighbor country, Chad, had just exploded. And so Peace Corps was busy evacuating the Chad volunteers into Cameroon. Could I, they asked, put together a conference for 25 of them in a week? Someday I'm going to write a book. It's going to be titled, Can You Be in Djibouti by Thursday? <laughs> it was quite a week. The evacuated volunteers arrived from all over the place, including Paris, where the French Foreign Legion had evacuated some of them to escape the fighting. When I finally got them all back together again, I realized that all 25 had had very different evacuation experiences. Some of them had been plucked unwilling from their village, blissfully unaware of the revolution going on. Others were in grave danger. Long before I was a storyteller, my first storytelling workshop happened when I put them together and I had them share their experiences. I will never forget the power of those stories. Then, when we returned to the United States in 91, I was ready. Ready to take on Peace Corps training positions in Morocco, in the Central African Republic, and in the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. And now, I measured my success not only in how well I did my job, but how well I functioned in the culture. And each new experience gave me new techniques, new insights into how to make that work. And then, in 1997, I found myself living in Jonesboro, Tennessee, which just happens to be the site of the annual National Storytelling Festival. <laughs> I joined a local storytelling group, and at age 56, began my sixth career as a storyteller. Now, all those years of international work are valuable in ways I could never even have imagined. When I tell an ancient Egyptian story <laughs> about a magician, I see the old gardener in my Morocco program. When I tell the Haitian story of Owl, I can see the villagers gathering together for a feast. Storytelling is my way of honoring all the people and all the places I have lived and worked.